The year was 1982. Let It Whip by the Daz Band was playing on the radio, and everyone was hyped for the NFL season. The Oakland Raiders had just won the Super Bowl, and everyone was wondering if they could repeat. But all of these fans would have their hopes dashed when a player strike would end up crippling the season and leaving a permanent asterisk next to its results. For 57 days, the teams didn't have their starting players, and for 57 days, the sports fans watched as negotiations played out for everyone to see. Hi, I'm Jake from Football Lore, and today we're going to be talking about the 1982 NFL player strike that shortened the season. Be sure to press the like button if you like NFL history videos like this. The 1982 season is odd, because it actually did get underway before the strike took place. The entire first week of the season was played normally, and it wasn't until the middle of week two when things really went off the rails. Speaking of off the rails, did you guys see that YouTuber who purposely derailed a train for views? Here on Football Lore, we promise to never purposely derail any trains during the making of our videos. When the strike came down, owners weren't really sure what to do, so they decided to cancel games until they came to a solution. This obviously was going to cost them mountains of cash. TV broadcasting rights is where a majority of teams get their revenue. Missing games meant they weren't going to get paid from the networks. It also meant they wouldn't be getting any ticket revenue from their stadiums, and a lack of new play meant a slow dwindling of interest from lukewarm fans. Fans. When a similar strike occurred just five years later, they would end up just playing games with stand-in players instead. What is weird about this is that the commissioner Pete Rozelle was aware that a strike was on the table. The NFLPA head had warned him that players were considering going on strike rather than play under their current collective bargaining agreement. What the league soon learned is that this strike was going to be expensive. In the first week alone, they lost $70 million in revenue. This forced them to come to the negotiating table, but they weren't going to like what they heard from the players. There has always been a weird relationship between players in pro sports leagues and the owners. Sure, they are paying them millions, but oftentimes it's because they are raking in hundreds of millions off the backs of the players' product. At the time, broadcasting rights had become huge, and this had meant a huge increase in owners' salaries because the current bargaining agreement focused more on ticket sales and merchandise for players' salaries. The players wanted more of a cut of overall league revenue, 55% to be exact. This would be a considerable decrease to the owners, but it wasn't their only demand. They also wanted a higher minimum salary and also more rights in free agency to prevent being locked to one team for their whole career. The owners initially scoffed at this, thinking there was no way the players would be willing to hold out for very long and that their demands would take too much of their profits. The players weren't dumb, however, and knew the team owners were quickly on their path to becoming multi-billionaires and were taking more and more of the pie they were supposed to share. The reasons for these demands were simple. The base salary in the NFL at the time was too low to play football as your full-time job. It also wasn't structured in a way that was fair to players. For example, a starter on the Chiefs once found out his backup was actually making $10,000 more than he was. The free agency request was because rules at the time allowed a team to basically lock a player into their team by matching whatever offer they received to force them to accept the contract. It stopped players from actually being able to initiate a bidding war for their play. The owners really did think they were going to be able to ride it out longer than any of the players could. However, as the weeks dragged on, the networks became more frustrated with the lack of programming. They had sold slots to advertisers who had thought primetime football would be playing, and instead were being met with random programs randomly picked to fill the time. The losses were mounting, and some networks were even starting to throw the word lawsuit around in reference to recovering some of the millions they had paid NFL for broadcasting rights. The the NFL did try desperately to try to put anything together. They tried to put on two different all-star games, but neither of them were able to draw a crowd in person or entertain on television. At this point, the owners were out of ideas and realized they had to at least negotiate with the players to get the games going again. Certain things were flat out non-negotiables from the owners. The player demands to have free agency were quickly shut down. They wouldn't be achieved until after the 1987 strike. They also were not going to give up 55% of total revenue but were willing to talk about higher wages. The players' union had a meeting of their own, but were divided on how to move forward. Some wanted to cave to the league's demand and get paid again, while others wanted to hold out even longer and see what offer they could get. Eventually, the side wanting to talk won, and the offer they ended up agreeing on wouldn't be perfect. It actually set the stage for the 1987 strike just five years later. However, it was a huge step up from the current compensation players were receiving, so it was taken as a victory at the time. 
The deal was relatively straightforward. The minimum rookie salary was raised from 22,000 to 30,000. However, veteran pay went from 30,000 to 140,000, which was a massive increase at the time. In today's dollars, this meant a veteran minimum of $450,000. They also secured severance pay for players who had spent more than 12 years in the league. They would receive 140,000 in severance once being released. As for their salary cap, they ended up receiving $1.6 billion over four years, which again, was a huge increase but less than the 55% they were looking for. The union also received half of the league's television broadcast package, and now the NFL was tasked with coming up with a way to save a season that had several weeks canceled due to strikes. Their solution was creative to say the least. They immediately removed all divisions and used two conferences instead. They would play the remaining regular season games, and then the top eight teams from each conference would advance to a sweet 16-style tournament to eventually play for the Super Bowl. At the end of the season, the AFC had their top eight teams, which consisted of the Rams. Rams, Dolphins, Bengals, Steelers, Chargers, Jets, Patriots, and Browns. While the NFC was bringing the Redskins, Cowboys, Packers, Vikings, Falcons, Cardinals, Buccaneers, and Lions to the party. After the first few rounds of play, the conference championships came down to the Dolphins and Jets in the AFC and the Cowboys and Redskins in the NFC. The Dolphins were led by the Killer Bees defense, and the Jets were riding the talents of Richard Todd. The game was pretty low scoring by today's standards, and Miami won with a final score of 14 to nothing. The NFC Championship was definitely more interesting with the divisional rivals facing off on a bigger stage. The Redskins had Joe Theismann, who was one of the best quarterbacks in the league, while the Cowboys had Tony Dorsett. The Redskins would win 31 to 17, setting up a Dolphins-Redskins Super Bowl matchup. The game was played at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California, but was a pretty one-sided affair with the Redskins winning handedly with a final score of 27-17. This was the franchise's first Super Bowl victory and cemented Joe Gibbs as a Washington legend. Obviously, the season is looked at strangely today, but at the time, you couldn't tell anyone in Washington that their Super Bowl was not legitimate. I do want to give the Redskins credit because they were a great team who had a good season. It was just shortened by several games, and we will never know how things would have played out over the course of a whole season. In football, one injury or bad game can cause a cascade of consequences, so the season does have to be viewed somewhat differently due to its shortened nature. There wasn't enough to really know what would have changed. It's a lot like time travel. The smallest thing shifted can have huge consequences over the long run. Without us even knowing, this season is always going to go down as one of the more peculiar the NFL has had in its very long history due to the way it was handled. Viewing it historically, there are a few important things to take away from the 1982 season. The first is that it gave the owners a guidebook on how to move forward. When the second strike came, just five years later, they knew that missing out on games was not an option and ended up signing scabs to put some sort of gameplay out for networks. This put the pinch on them a lot less financially because they had already played this game before they knew that they needed to keep revenue moving if they were going to win the negotiations. I also think that it let the owners know that players were willing to play hardball. When this entire strike started, a lot of the owners found it laughable the players could ever organize in a meaningful way that affected league operations or their bottom lines. At the very least, it made them take the threat of player organization more seriously and make more changes to improve the player experience. I also think it showed players that they have the potential to make changes to the league if they really push for it as a collective. Before this strike, most players thought they had no power. Many thought the entire strike was a waste of time because the owners would never be willing to negotiate with them. This proved that if they worked as a unit, it was possible to get ownership to listen and make changes. It also really did set the stage for what would come in 1987 and beyond in terms of player demands. The free agency idea is one of the main reasons the strike took place in 1987, and we all know how much that changed the NFL. The modern NFL has been reshaped by free agency and players being able to negotiate and move teams. Entire dynasties have been built by it too. It also set the stage for players paying more attention to the league's money. The modern NFLPA knows what their revenue share is, and their goal is to increase it. They aren't going to be caught flat-footed with a bad deal that totally leaves out streaming services revenue the way this generation did with broadcasting rights. I also think the NFL has learned that overall their life is a lot easier when players are happy and not causing issues with league operations. The product on the field is a lot better when the players actually want to be there. 
The changes to veteran pay also made being a football player a much more stable career. If you could get to be a veteran in the league, it meant that you had a guaranteed high income so you could focus solely on training and preparing for your games. This really helped elevate the game to the next level, and the on-the-field product reflected the increase in dedication from players. It also set the stage for the financial advisor and pension program the modern NFL Players Union has. Uh, I think the only thing they really could have done better is make sure to have gotten free agency earlier. They did get it eventually, but that is what really tipped the balance to players when it came to the negotiating power and salary influence. When that happened is when we really started to see bidding wars for star players that brought the average salary up for everyone in the league regardless of skill level. That is the story of the strike-shortened 1982 NFL season. It did set a lot of precedent in the league and is a weird chapter in NFL history. If you enjoyed this video, press the like button and comment down below. Also subscribe if you love NFL videos like this. On Football Lore, we post two football documentaries a week and would love your support on our journey to hit 10,000 subscribers by the end of the year. Our last video was about the tragic story of Lawrence Phillips, so give it a watch. Thank you for watching.